Welcome back to F1 Tenth. My name is Hossam Abbas, and I am a research fellow in the Electrical and Systems Engineering Department at the University of Pennsylvania. This is week two. Last week, we gave an overview of the three key operations involved in building autonomous race cars, perception, planning, and control. In last week's tutorials, you worked with Ross and enabled keyboard control of the car. This week, we will delve into perception, planning, and control in greater depth. This is where the rubber meets the road. We will cover two basic sensors that the car carries, IMU and LiDAR, the algorithm used on the car for localization, and proportional integral derivative control for following the center line in a hallway. Each of these can warrant a much longer discussion. Our goal this week is to have you understand these issues sufficiently well so that by the end of the week, you will have programmed the car to drive autonomously in a straight line. Let's get going. Our topic in perception is sensors. What are the sensors we use, where are they placed on the car, and what data do they give us? First off, the inertial measurement unit, or IMU. An IMU provides acceleration, velocity, and attitude measurements. As you know from basic physics or mechanics, velocity is the time derivative of position. That's the speed. Acceleration is the time derivative of velocity. The other measurement an IMU gives is attitude. It is the orientation of the car in 3D space. Attitude is given by three angles. Yaw, which is the rotation about the vertical z-axis. Roll, which is the rotation around the x-axis. As shown, the x-axis points from the back of the car to the front of the car. And pitch, which is the rotation of the car around the y-axis, perpendicular to the x-axis and the horizontal plane, as shown in the figure. In this course, we will only be concerned with yaw and consider pitch and roll to be negligible. Certainly, as the car's maneuvers become more aggressive and extreme, the effects of pitch and roll might need to be taken into account. On the IMU, three gyroscopes measure the attitude, yaw, pitch, and roll. Three accelerometers measure linear acceleration, and by integration, we can compute linear velocity. We could integrate linear velocity to get position, but this estimate of velocity suffers from too much noise that gets accumulated, so we won't use it. Finally, three magnetometers are used to validate the readings of the gyroscopes and accelerometers. We use, in this course, the Razor IMU from SparkFun. It fits in the palm of your hand, as you saw. You can see where the IMU is placed on our cars. The important thing is that it is rigidly attached to the car's chassis. If it is wiggling, then obviously this affects the readings of the sensors on board. For example, the accelerometers would also be measuring the IMU's own movement, not just the car's. The effects of vibration are countered by Kalman filtering of the raw measurements. Here is the ROS message for the IMU. It is a C-struct. The orientation member of the struct gives the car's orientation in quaternion form. We will have more to say about quaternions and rotations in a later lecture. The angular velocity member of the struct is the angular velocity around all three axes, and linear acceleration is the linear acceleration along all three axes. Note also the covariance matrices for angular velocity and linear acceleration. The diagonals of the matrices give the variance of each measurement. The variance quantifies how reliable the measurement is or how noise susceptible the sensor is. This is important to know for the algorithms that use this data. Next up is the LIDAR. Depending on whom you ask, LIDAR stands for either light radar or light detection and ranging. A LIDAR provides depth or distance information. How far away from the car are the objects in the scene? A LIDAR is typically placed on top of the car to have an unobstructed view of the scene. The basic idea behind the LIDAR's operation is simple enough. The LIDAR shoots a laser beam at an object and measures the amount of time for the beam to be reflected back. Half that time multiplied by the speed of light gives the distance to the obstacle. This is the basic idea. Many factors complicate the picture. Temperature variations, surface reflectivity, poor angle of incidence of the laser on the obstacle, and so on. But the basic idea is as I described it. A LIDAR doesn't shoot one laser beam. That wouldn't be of much use. Different LIDARs have different specs. The LIDAR we use is a Hokuyu UST 10LX. It scans the environment at a rate of 40 Hz, meaning it sends out its lasers once every 25 milliseconds. Every scan produces 1080 rays separated by 0.25 degrees. That's the angular resolution. If you add it up, this means it covers a 270 degrees horizontal field of view. Let me set up the scene first. We have a top view on the room. 
the LiDAR is at the bottom center, a person, myself in this case, starts by standing in front of the LiDAR facing it with a whiteboard behind me. The LiDAR sees the world as points. Every point, roughly, corresponds to a laser beam bouncing off an object. Obviously, occlusions can occur where one object hides another object behind it, as in this case. Part of the whiteboard is hidden by the person. The moving group of red dots you see is me backing away from the LiDAR, then moving closer again, moving to the right of the LiDAR, and then dropping out of its field of view. The ROS message structure for LiDAR is pretty straightforward. In particular, ranges is the array of distances to the obstacles in the scenes. Element I of ranges is the distance to the object along step I. Recall that step I is the I plus first laser beam produced by the LiDAR, and there are 1,080 steps for the 10 LX LiDAR we are using. If you listen to the LiDAR ROS topic, you will see arrays being printed. Each array comes from one LiDAR scan, i.e. one time instant. Measurements outside the min-max range should be discarded. They are not reliable measurements. Here we see what the LiDAR on board the car sees as it is navigating in the hallway. The walls within LiDAR range are detected. Notice the T-junction when the car comes up to it. This concludes the perception part of this week's lecture. In the next set of videos, we'll cover localization and control.